Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. I'm taking a different approach today with some of the chats, and I'm going to interview someone absolutely fascinating. Miss International Gay Rodeo Association 2019, Miss Priscilla Bouvier. Miss Priscilla is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. How are you, Priscilla? I'm doing good, Doug. How are you? Great. I'm happy to have you on the program. You're the first person from the entire rodeo association I've had the privilege to be able to interview. Well, I'm honored and I'm glad to be here as well. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy about it. Let's start right at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and your family, because you have a little bit of a unique uh, background there. Uh, I do. Uh, so legally, my name is Paul V. Hill, and I come for, to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico, like you said. Uh, born and raised here in, in Albuquerque. Uh, actually born and raised on the same property uh, where I live now. I live in my grandparents' house, which I inherited from, from them, and I uh, have never left this this piece of land uh, since I was born. Um, I am privileged and honored to have two biological daughters, uh, Angelina and Lily, ages 27 and 25, along with uh, my partner's son, who's 11. And then we have two grandkids, a five-year-old granddaughter and a one-year-old grandson. How wonderful. Now, is there some reason you never left uh, the homestead and moved <laughs> on? Um, I didn't. Well, I guess because it, it was available. It was here. Uh, it was convenient. Um, and it's where I grew up. Uh, there's nothing. I don't think there's anything better than being able to stay in the place where you grew up, especially if you love your community and you love the area and you have a home that that's yours. Tell me a little bit about uh, having children. You were previously married? Yes, I was married for uh, six years. We were married for six years. Uh, I got married when I was nine. I was 20. I was, I'm sorry, I was 20 when we got married. Uh, 20 when my oldest daughter was born. So was, I was relatively young. Why did you I choose to marry so young? Uh, things happened at the beginning of that relationship uh, that, you know, doing things that young kids do. And, and, uh, my ex-wife got pregnant, um, at the beginning of our relationship. And so I decided to go ahead and take that route and, and get married and, and start a family, which I have no regret doing. Did you know you were a gay man at that time? I did. Uh, I have no, I had known for quite a while that I was, that I was gay actually since probably since I was little, um, that I was different than everybody else and, and that I was attracted to, to, to men. Um, but I felt that with the situation that I needed to do what was right and, uh, and get married and, and raise a family and, and live that life. That's a very strong choice to make. It, it is. Uh, it, it was a very strong choice, but I, like I said, I don't regret making that choice. Um, eventually I did come out to my wife and, and to the rest of my family and, and we decided to, to cross that path or we decided to go ahead and, and accept it for what it was and continue to raise our kids as, as parents and as, as not as a couple, but as their mom and dad, which we did, we had, and we still do. Um, we are still great friends to this day and we raised our kids together. How old are your children now? 27 and 25. Oh, how wonderful. Now, how did your children take you coming out as a gay man? Uh, they were they were relatively young when, when they came out. My oldest daughter was six. My youngest daughter was four. Um, so they accepted it for what it was. And we decided to teach them as time went on about what having a gay parent and being gay meant. You know, they were, like I said, they were young. So it was hard to break things down for them to... Uh, in a way that they would understand. So we felt it better to just raise them with it. And um, that seemed to work out really well because as they had questions, we answered those questions as they grew. I'm wondering if there are probably other gay parents out there facing uh, similar situations. What advice can you offer them? 
my advice would is to be honest with them uh answer their questions honestly and openly openly and always keep that line of communication open and keep your mind open when answering those questions you don't have to be detailed when answering the questions but let them be honest with them when when it comes to their questions i think that's the best advice we can i can give what were some of the questions your children asked um they were very specific they weren't very specific that they asked uh or as far as their questions they asked um why I liked men and not women, um, why pretty much basically why we were getting divorced, why I wasn't living at home. Um, those were the types of questions that we got from them. It was ne never sexual in context as far as their questions. I think they kind of learned that on their own uh, because I never got those questions. Um, I got questions about gay pride and the different events that, that we would go to those those questions those were the questions that i would get what did you tell them uh, i told them that gay pride uh for instance you know when they asked me what gay pride was i explained to them you know that there was a time when we couldn't be as open as we are now and and that our the people that came before us created an event like this so that we could express that that pride that we have in being who we are very good that's very forward it, we we were very we were very honest with them. Tell me about coming out as a gay man in Albuquerque. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, Albuquerque doesn't have a very very large community. Uh, we do have we do have a community. I'm not saying that we don't, but it's not very large. Uh, I found it to be very um, unfriendly when I first came out. Uh, very cliquish. Uh, very hard to meet people and. Uh, Feel like I was included in in the community here in Albuquerque. It took a long, long time for me to feel like I had a home here. Why do you think that it was a bit clickish? Any idea? Uh, I don't. I really don't have an uh, any idea why it was like that. I looking back on it, I I still don't understand why it presented itself in that way. What kinds of places were you frequenting at that time? Uh, at that time, really, the only places we had were, were bars. Um, we had a few different bars here in Albuquerque. I think there were four or five at that time. Um, and that's what everybody did. Everybody just went to the bars on the weekends. And, and that was really the only place that you could go, um, unlike now. This was a big step for you, being out in the gay bars. What were your thoughts and your feelings about these new surroundings, any concerns? No, I didn't have any real concerns about being out in the bars. Um, I was very shy at that time, and uh, I still hadn't really, you know, I was in my late 20s, early 30s, and so I was still figuring myself out. Um, and so for me, it was, it was just very, it was exciting, but scary at the same time because I was so afraid to talk to people and, uh, you know, this was right before the internet explosion, um, I guess. And so, you know, there really wasn't a lot of information to research by yourself. So you kind of had to, I kind of had to figure it out on my own. Um, you know, one story that I always tell people is the, when I was at, at one of the bars that I frequented, which was the ranch here in Albuquerque, um, I was walking around the bar and, and I ran into a, uh, a dark doorway and I didn't know what it was. I've been going to the bar for, for, for a couple months and, but I really didn't know what was in this dark doorway. <laughs> and I walked in and it was the leather bar oh. and uh, it, I, I didn't even know it was there. And, and there was just, it, it was fascinating to me because it was a whole new experience of this new world that I was entering that I didn't know anything about. You know, there was porn playing on the TV screens. There was um, equipment all around that was being used. And there was just a bunch of guys in there and it was very dark. And so it was, it was very fascinating and, and exciting for me to, to uh, discover that. <laughs> what was fascinating and what was exciting? Uh, well, just the whole 
I think what was exciting about it was the darkness is it was so almost secretive, but not secretive because everybody knew it was there. Um, and what was fascinating was just, it was just a whole different um, experience, uh, a whole different group of people that I guess had a different, what the way I saw it, it was had a different side to them. And what did you feel about that or think about that? Um, I was intrigued. I wanted to learn more. And so that kind of um, started my inquisitive side. And that's when I started asking questions and and started becoming unafraid to open my mouth and and talk to people. What did you learn? Uh, I learned uh, about the leather community. I learned about um, the various other communities that we had, you know, drag queens, the just the various organizations that we had within within our own community. So at that time, you didn't know a lot of these different uh, elements to the community? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I knew that there was gay rodeo uh, because I had run into gay rodeo in the early 90s. Um, but other than that, I really didn't know much about our own my own community that I was coming into. Take a step back and tell me more about the gay rodeo. How were you introduced to that? <laughs> That's a, uh, I think it's a funny story. It was in 1994. Uh, I was fresh out of high school. I was just in my second year, I guess my second year of college. And uh, my brother, I, so I have two, um, I have four other siblings. They're half siblings from my, uh, my father had a previous marriage before he met my mom. So they're much older than I am. But my brother is a DJ. And uh, he had uh, been con- contracted to DJ the gay rodeo here in Albuquerque at the Sheriff's Posse Arena where our rodeo used to be held. And uh, he didn't know what it was, really what it was. All he knew is that it was a rodeo and it was a different kind of rodeo, but he knew I loved rodeo. I was on the rodeo team at New Mexico State. And so he told me, hey, why don't you come with me? I'm going to DJ a rodeo. I need help with the equipment. So I went with him and uh, when we got there, looked like any other rodeo you would go to, a bunch of horse trailers, a bunch of people. We loaded the equipment, he set up, things started, the day progressed. And then I realized that it was a gay rodeo that couples, male couples were walking around holding hands, um, had my real first experience encountering a drag queen. Um, Women were, you know, there were same sex couples all over the place. Then, so it dawned on me and I finally went and picked up a program and realized that it was a rodeo being put on by the New Mexico Gay Rodeo Association, which I had no idea there was any, even anything like that around. Tell me a little more about it. How did it begin to evolve for you? Uh, at that point, I still uh, wasn't out. Um, you know, I was I actually was right a few months, just a few months shy of me meeting my ex-wife and and uh, our oldest daughter being conceived <laughs> when that happened. Um, but it it just it completely intrigued me because I had grown up around rodeo my entire life and and grew up in agriculture. And uh, never really thought that there was this whole community out there of gay and lesbian couples and gay and lesbian cowboys. It just never dawned on me that they were there. And maybe it was because I was too blind when I was younger to really notice. I won't say blind, but just maybe too naive. Um, Mm. I never, I never thought about it. I knew what I was and I knew that I was, you know, that I was different from every, from the other boys in, in school that I didn't, wasn't attracted to girls, but I didn't look at the world around me as, I guess, as a whole. And so it, it, it was just very exciting for me to discover that. And then I kind of suppressed it for a number of years um, after I got married and had kids. <laughs> what were your thoughts when you met a drag queen for the first time? So one of the first drag queens that I met <laughs> um, was she at that time, and I didn't know it because I didn't know what was going on, but at that time she was Miss International Gay Rodeo 1994. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, Miss Tessie. She was representing the Southeastern Gay Rodeo Association. Uh, and of course she's not, now she's in Texas, but um, that was one of the first drag queens I ever met. And she, to be honest, that day I thought it was a woman until she spoke. <laughs> and and Tessie doesn't have a very deep voice, but she can tell a man's voice from a female, you know, from a male voice from a female voice. And that's that was one of the first drag queens that I ever met. 
And uh, she's, I consider her a great friend to this day. What were your thoughts? How did you feel about that? Uh, you know, it didn't bother me. It didn't shock me. Uh, it didn't um, cause me any great, you know, like any confusion or, or anything like that. I didn't really didn't think anything of it. It's just another, it was just another aspect of, of that day. And I think I was still so in shock about the whole gay cowboy thing that meeting a drag queen for the first time kind of took a backseat to everything else that was going on that day. <laughs> and then I never thought about it. I really never thought about it after. There was a lag of time in between when you were first introduced until you actually acted upon exploring that part of the community, correct? Correct. There was I will, probably about 10 years. Okay. You mentioned when we were preparing for this interview that when you came out, your friends had to teach you how to be gay. Uh, they did. Uh, uh, friends of mine had to teach me how to, I guess, gay it up uh, and earn my my gay card, as as they called it. Uh, you know, I've always been a cowboy. That's 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 just how I was raised. That's that's the life that I grew up in. And so entering into a gay community that has this whole that had this whole stereotype at that time and still does, um, you know, was different for me. I, I really didn't care about my hair. I didn't care about, really care about the way I dressed. I dressed the same every single day. Um, and so, you know, my friends were like, well, no, you can't do that. You got to get, your hair's got to be cut different. You know, you're, uh, the way I said is I learned how to match my belt to my shoes. Um, because I had one belt and it was a Western style belt with a buckle on it. And I wore it with everything. Um, I never had any other belts <laughs> and nor did I ever really have any co other colored shoes. And I didn't know that you melt matched your belt to your shoes. I didn't know that if you didn't do that, that it was considered, you know, I guess a faux pas. And so they had to teach me how to be gay. <laughs> well, what else did they teach you? I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask. <laughs> um, I guess some of the things that they taught me was uh, one of the first, I know it, TV was a big, was a big, um deal because everybody was watching sex in the city everybody you know queer eye for the straight guy had just come out uh at that time it was i think it was premier season premieres were going on um learning how to you know shop at different stores other than um a western store because that's the only place i ever went to <laughs> um learning how to you know i guess go out to a bar, um, how to show people you're interested when you're out, you know, um, learning about adult video stores, you know, the etiquette, it, you know, that type of, that type of stuff. <laughs> I can't help but ask you, what is the etiquette for that? Uh, I, I don't know because I wasn't, uh, one to, they kind of scared me. <laughs> what was the biggest change they had you make in order to accommodate being gay? Uh, I guess I'd have to say one of the biggest changes was really paying attention to my parents um, and paying attention to, you know, that moisturizing my skin and taking care of it and getting a haircut every, you know, once a month versus me who would get, you know, a haircut maybe once every four months <laughs> because I always wore a hat. So <laughs> it didn't, it didn't, wasn't a, um, a priority to me. And so I think just take, in general, taking care, better care of myself and, and realizing that I need to take care of myself um, to be a good person. But I think it's more of a vanity thing. I think it, it was more of a, you have to take care of yourself to attract somebody. How did other people in your world react to that? For example, your family, when they started to, making these changes? Um, they weren't too shocked. Um, <laughs> when I came out, so I didn't actually have the opportunity to actually come out to my family. My ex-wife did it for me. Um, after I came out to her, she uh, told everybody. And so she, uh, she's the one that made, I think that job easier on me um, by outing me. But a conversation I had 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 with my dad was that, uh, you know, he goes, we always knew, we always knew you were. And so I think for them, it, it was, it, it was expected 
when changes, when I started making those changes, they were expecting it. Um, and once I did come out to my wife and, you know, we, we did separate and started the divorce process, it was just next, ex- they expected it from me. Tell me about your thoughts and your feelings about coming out as gay at that time. What were your expectations, disappointments, anything like that? Well, <laughs> I guess when when I decided to to come out to my wife, uh, number one, I was expected to get hit. Uh, I was expecting her to punch me. I was expecting to be some there to be some physical um, emotion out of it, and there wasn't. Um, and so that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit because I was I was kind of ready for it, mm. and it didn't happen. Um, when I came out to her, I had this huge pressure release. Uh, I felt like all this pressure was just gone uh, because I had been holding it in for so long. And uh, once I said the words, you know, I'm gay, it, it went away. And it was neat because then I, didn't, I felt like I didn't have to hide anything anymore. And uh, conversations that I had with, with family members you know, and, and we're, we're, we're a traditional Hispanic family where, you know, emotions aren't voiced, <laughs> you know, they're kind of, kind of kept in and you don't, you know, unless it's something really, really big and it doesn't get talked about. If it's not bothering you, you just leave it alone and, you know, move on with your life. And, and I think that's what happened is people, it works, like I said, they were expecting it. So when it happened, they were just able to to go on with their life. And I was able to go on with mine. So if I had, I didn't have the traditional, very dramatic coming out um, story that a lot of people have. Okay. And, and I, so when I talk to people who have those, I don't know how to respond to them. I don't know how to react because I didn't have that. I had a lot of support and I had, um, a, I didn't have any drama behind it. It just, it was, it's, it's the only way I can explain it. That's wonderful. I'm very fortunate. I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> How did things evolve for you then? Um, they kind of, it just took a natural, it took its natural, what I consider its natural course. You know, I had friends that were gay and introduced, they introduced me to the community and, and to what it was to be gay. And, and I kind of figured it out for myself from there on out. Um, you know, I knew the gay rodeo existed. So that was one of the first things that I wanted to do when I came out was, was figure out how that worked and and how I could become involved in that because that was what I had always done. So how did you? Uh, I, there was a, I saw an advertisement, I believe it was at, at one of the bars that had the New Mexico Gay Road Association on it, advertising their upcoming membership meeting that was going to be held that month at one of the local restaurants here in town. And so I decided, well, I'm going to go and, and see what it's about and, and join. And I didn't realize that, the New Mexico Gay Rodeo Association was part of a bigger, bigger organization. First impressions? Uh, I was excited because these were people who were just like me. Uh, they, they lived on ranches and farms or grew up on ranches and farms. They worked with animals. You know, they enjoyed the sport of rodeo uh, and didn't think of it as a um, rough and tumble sport. It was just, it was just something that, happened you know it was something they loved and they loved to talk about it and i could talk about it to them whereas my gay friends had no idea what what i was talking about when i would talk to them about rodeo because that wasn't a part of their life where it was an everyday part of mine so was, i was excited <laughs> how big an organization was it um at that time there was i guess it, there was about 80 or 90 members oh. uh the active members we're close to about 40 active members at that time. Uh, so it was a relatively big organization. They still, you know, they put on their annual rodeo and, and went through the normal monthly struggles that every association goes to when preparing for a rodeo. They were talking about upcoming rodeos that were coming up. And, and so it was, it, was, it was exciting. Again, it was exciting for me. Were there any surprises? Um, no, well, there were, I guess there were surprises um, when it came to the rodeo events. 
uh, I wasn't, you know, in regular rodeo or straight rodeo. I'm so used to the men's events and then the women's one event that they have. Um, whereas in gay rodeo, the women and men compete in all events equally. Um, and in some of the events they compete as teams. So it could be two men, two women, a man and a woman, two men and a woman, two women and a man. It just kind of depends on the event, but they compete against each other equally in all events. How much does the gay rodeo mirror the heterosexual rodeo? Uh, very closely. So they have all the same events. Uh, there's some uh, um, modifications to some events, but we both the gay and, and regular rodeo have bull riding. They have uh, saddle bronc riding, uh, team roping, uh, barrel racing, you know, just a few of the events that you would find in a regular rodeo. And then we have events that have been modified. So for instance, in regular rodeo, you have an event called tie down roping, or some people call it, call it calf roping. And that's where you rope a calf on horseback and then the rider gets down and, and ties three legs, you know, ties three legs together and time stops as fast as times wins. Uh, within gay rodeo, we have calf roping on foot where it's a little bit more modified. You still have a calf, you know, which is a baby cow and uh, they rope it and then fastest time wins. Um, or we have uh, one event you'll find in, in, gay ro in regular rodeo is steer wrestling. And so steer wrestling is, it's a steer, which is a castrated male cow or a certain breed of cow. It's called a coronet. It's the coronet breed. And uh, steer wrestling, the steers released from the chute uh, rider on horseback r rides up on it, slides off the horse's back onto the steers and wrestles it to the ground. Fastest time wins. In gay rodeo, we have shoot dogging. You start in the shoot with the steer, bring it out and wrestle it to the ground. Fastest time wins. You know, so there's some modifications, but all the events are still the same, are, are basically the same. Why is it modified for the gay rodeo? Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, I, I don't see there being very many steer wrestlers. You know, some of the events are, are expensive, uh, not only to compete in them, but to have the animals trained to do it. You know, tie down roping horses in regular rodeo, those are highly specialized, highly trained horses. Oh. And, you know, um, and those are cow cowboys that are riding those horses. They're rodeoing full time. This is their job. This is how they make their living. Oh. Gay rodeo is not set up like that to be able to do that. And so to have to keep those horses, keep those highly trained horses, you know, on, on their game, that takes a lot of money and time. And so I think it's, it's, and to include everybody, I think we modify our events so that anybody can compete. You know, if you've never thrown a rope or, you know, um, gotten near a calf, you could still compete in calf roping on foot. You know, we could take you and show, we could give you a couple lessons and in, in 30 minutes, you could be roping a calf on foot in the rodeo arena at a gay rodeo. You know, you, they're, they're very user-friendly. Fascinating. It's a good way to say it. <laughs> now, how uniform is it across, for example, the United States or Canada? How uniform are, is, are the, events? Or the rodeos? Uh, the gay rodeos? Yes. The gay rodeos are all the same uh, in any, any, and let me, let me slow down just a little bit. Any rodeo that is sanctioned by the International Gay Rodeo Association will run the same anywhere you go. Okay. Whether it's in Albuquerque, Palm Springs, uh, Florida, Washington, D.C., or Calgary, Alberta, they'll will, they will all run the same because we follow the same set of rules. Tell me about the people who traveled throughout all over competing in these rodeos, participating in the rodeos. How does that work? So anybody can compete in, in one of our rodeos, whether you're gay, straight, uh, bi, transgender. Uh, number one, as long as you're a member of a recognized association within the International Gay Rodeo Association. Uh, you pay your yearly membership do and you can compete at any rodeo whether um and it's completely up to you whether what rodeo you want to attend uh for instance this year we have rodeos starting now in february in phoenix i will be going to phoenix to compete um this year um and i will set my own schedule 
on which rodeos I want to attend this year, just kind of depending on what I, what my goal is. You know, if I want to qualify for World Gay Rodeo Finals, then I will make as many rodeos as I can. If I just want to go and have fun, I may go to two rodeos. It just, it all depends. But you have people from all over the U.S., uh, all different backgrounds that come and compete at our gay rodeos. And it's, I think that's what makes it so, so much fun. When you say compete, and what are you going to compete? So uh, in within, we have 13 approved events within gay rodeo. So we have our rough stock events, which includes bull riding, ranch saddle bronc riding, shoot dogging, and um, steer riding. So those are what we call our rough stock events. Then we have our timed events, which are barrel racing, pole bending, and flag race. Then we have our roping events, which are team roping, calf roping on foot, and breakaway roping. And then our camp events, which are our fun events that have been gate up a little bit. <laughs> and that is steer decorating, goat dressing, and wild drag. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get into those in a minute. Um, but um, those are, we have 13, 13 approved events. I compete in uh, calf roping on foot, shoot dogging. Uh, I'll do the, I'll do the camp events. So the goat dressing, steer deco, steer decorating and uh, wild drag. But I'll also compete in the speed events, which are the barrel racing, pole bending and flag race. So that's separate from your personality as Miss International Gay Rodeo Association, clearly. Yeah, it is. Uh, I won't be. I wouldn't be doing it in drag. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. uh, I'm too pretty for all that. Um, is the way I is the way I explain it. Um, but uh, the I do compete, uh, and that's you know. But it, it is a different. It is a different side to to me personally because it's it's the side that I've always known. You know, the drag part and Priscilla and the Miss International Gay Rodeo, that's a whole different side. So what I'm understanding is that there are basically two sections of this for you. So yes. you're basically having to do double the work. No, not anymore. So um, in 2000, so each, let me explain how, how, it, how Priscilla became Miss International Gay Rodeo Association. Yes, um, each one of the rodeo associations has a royalty team. And the royalty team consists usually of a four of a four person team, which is a miss, which is your drag queen, a mister, which is your man, an MR, a Ms, which is your female or your lesbian, and then your Mister, which is your drag king, which is usually a female dressed in male drag. They are the fundraisers, they are the face of the organizations, they are the ones that are attending events, putting on events, raising money for their association, along with raising money for their charities. Uh, because one thing that I would like to mention is that everything we do is for charity. Um, we all have a charity partner that we partner with for all our rodeos. And so the majority of the money that we take in for our rodeos gets given out to charity. So they select their royalty teams, the associations select their royalty teams who reign for a whole year and raise money for their association for charity. And, uh, at the end of the year at the World Gay Finals Rodeo is the annual International Gay Rodeo Association Royalty Competition, uh, which is a can be a 12 member team, depending on the number of contestants that compete from each hosting association. Um, and there again, they are the face of the organization. They are the fundraisers for the International Gay Rodeo Association. And it's a huge honor to be on that team, to make that team. And uh if for a whole year, you get to work on behalf of the International Gay Rodeo so Association and Gay Rodeo representing both and traveling and working within your community to raise awareness and outreach and, and raise money for charity. So in 2017, I competed for Miss New Mexico Gay Rodeo Association, and I was honored enough to be selected to represent New Mexico for 2018. And I did. Uh, and I traveled the rodeo circuit and... Uh, then in 20, at the end of 2018, World Gay Finals Rodeo was in Mesquite, Texas. And uh, at the annual uh, International Gay Rodeo Association Royalty Competition, I was honored to have been selected as Miss International Gay Rodeo 2019. And so um, I spent 2019 traveling the rodeo circuit, 
doing community outreach, raising money for charity, and representing Gay Rodeo and the Western lifestyle within our community and outside of our community. So that's how, that's how that evolved. But I've always been a competitor. I've always been a rodeo competitor. But your title as, as Miss International, that's obviously carried over due to COVID. No, I was actually lucky enough to step down from my title in October of 2019. Okay. And uh, the new team stepped up. Um, took over our, our role at, the, at January 1st, 2020. And so they were in rain for three months before COVID hit. Got it. And then things shut down and they have been in rain um, through, through now. They're still in rain through uh, 2022. They will be stepping down in February in Phoenix. They wow. finally get to give up their titles. <laughs> Wow. Well, but they've had two years. That's true of so many title holders right now. It is. Yeah. What charities did you benefit? Uh, so the charities that I, I supported when um, we, in 2018 here locally um, and in 2019, my local charities that I supported were, of course, my own host association, the New Mexico Gay Radio Association. We are a 501c4 organization, so uh, I was able to support them. One of the other charities that we supported was the New Mexico Transgender Resource Center. Uh -huh. And they're one of our, our statewide resource center for our trans community. They do so much for um, not just our, our trans community, but our entire LGBTQI plus community here in New Mexico. Um, Empower, which is a youth organization that help and work with um, the LGBTQI plus youth within our community. The United Court of the Sandias, or there are Imperial Court System here in New Mexico at that time. Uh, we raised money for them, they raised money for us. Um, the Big Brothers Big Sisters was another organization that we supported in 2019, in 2018 and in 19, and the Agora Rape Crisis Center. Oh, that's quite a list. Yes, we had, we had quite a few oh, charities that we supported both in 2018 and 2019. Um, throughout our doing doing our work for our organ for our community have you any idea how much you generated how much money so uh, in 2019 we were able to give close to ten thousand dollars total to to five different organizations and then in 2019 we raised another seven thousand to give to um that we split between our, our charities and then this year in 2021 we were able to give close to $1,000 just from the funds raised at our own rodeo to Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Central New Mexico. That's absolutely beautiful. Yes, and that's the, that's the whole reason we do what we do is to raise money for charity. I wouldn't get in drag for if, if, it, wasn't, if it didn't have a good reason behind it. When we prepared for this interview, you told me that you don't receive any funds toward your, your drag attire, your makeup, anything. No, How we don't. in the world do you manage it? Uh, well, you know, I have a job. And so, um, and good thing I have a, bar a partner that has good budgeting skills. <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we don't receive any kind of, of financial gain from doing this. This is all volunteer. Um, we don't keep any of our tips. We don't request any travel money. We don't request any kind of compensation whatsoever. Everything we do is out of our own pocket. And, and I'm perfectly okay with that. And that's travel as well, isn't it? Yes, that includes travel as well. Wow. So during your reign, where were you able to travel? So during my reign, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, go to Arizona, to uh, Colorado, Texas, California, Arkansas, and I was able to do a fundraiser down in Mexico. In Mexico, wow. Yes. Now, when we prepared for this as well, you told me you you were interviewed on Univision. Yes, I was. Uh, I was interviewed on Univision or Univision, um, Univision. TV a yeah. uh, number of times. I think a total of four times between 2018 and 2019. Um, it started in, in Texas in 2018 when we were at the Texas Tradition Rodeo, which is Texas's annual rodeo. That year was in April, April of 2018. And uh, I had been approached 
and asked if I would do an interview. And I said, sure. And, and I said, with who? And they told me, and I said, oh, okay. So I didn't realize that it was in Spanish until they told me that I was going to have to do this interview in Spanish. And uh, I was Miss New Mexico Gay Rodeo Association at the time. And so I first wanted to make sure that they were okay with me doing an interview in Texas regarding, you know, for Texas Gay Rodeo Association because they had their miss at the time. And, and I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to step on anybody's toes, but they said, yeah, that was fine because their miss didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I did the interview and it came out great. It was, I was able to get a clip of, of the interview and uh, the crew that was there were really, really nice. And we became friends. And then when I went back in October to Mesquite for the world gay finals rodeo, I met up with them again and did another interview Wow. Uh, with them. And then when I went back in 2019, I did, they were the same crew was there. We reconnected. I did another interview with them there. Um, the Texas rodeo was actually, a, I did a number of interviews uh, at the Texas gay rodeo. That was the rodeo. I ended up being on Dallas housewives. Um, while we were at the Texas rodeo, the, the Dallas housewives crew was there because uh, Lori Larkin was the grand marshal and she's one of the housewives from Dallas. And so she was our grand marshal. And so I had the opportunity to interview with them. But um, I went to Colorado when I went to Denver's rodeo, there was a crew there from Univision Colorado and they approached me and they said, we were told by our, one of our Texas crews to reach out to you and find you. And so I did an interview in Denver for them um, and I did all these interviews in Spanish. <laughs> what sorts of things did they want to know? Uh, they just wanted to, you know, wanted to know, of course, the difference between gay rodeo and regular rodeos, um, the types of people that attend, the types of people that compete, the different kind of events that we had. They really were really interested in our camp events, you know, like our goat dressing and wild drag events. Uh, that's what they wanted. And, and they also were very interested to know which charities we were benefiting at each one of those rodeos, which I felt was, to me, was the most important part. Now, what set you in the forefront to win the title? Um, I want to say, I, I, I want to hope that it was my passion that I uh, admitted to the judges. Uh, so we, the International Gear Rodeo Association pageant is a judged event. It is a pageant that was a three-day pageant. And we are judged by a panel of five to seven judges. Uh, based on our knowledge of gay rodeo and our personality and, of course, talent, horsemanship, and uh, Western wear. So, you know, we, we just can't be a pretty face. We actually have to, to know what we're talking about and what is going on with, within gay rodeo and within our, our community. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping that it was my passion that showed people that I was the best person to do the job. You were asked a very interesting uh, question. Uh, I was asked a lot of interesting questions. Well, uh, one that came up in our pre-interview for this was how do you explain it to a blind person? Yes, I was asked how I explained, how you explain uh, goat dressing to a blind person. And um, that was one of the questions that I kind of thought about all year while I was preparing for the IGRA pageant is how I could explain an event to somebody who couldn't see it because I think that's one of the hardest things to do is explain something to somebody when they can't see it and not only does it apply to rodeo but I think it, it applies to the LGBTQI plus community as a whole yeah. um, when you're trying to explain our community to those that have never experienced it or are trying to argue an opposing point. I think if you can explain an event like goat dressing to a blind person, you can explain anything to anybody. And so, yeah, I had to explain how to, I had to explain goat dressing to, uh, to, a, blind, to a blind person. <laughs> That's fascinating. Uh, I don't know, I, I, at that time it, I, it would roll off my tongue you know, it would just roll off my tongue. Now, two years, you know, almost three years later, I don't, I think I'd have to be, I think I'd have to practice it a little bit <laughs> to uh, make it sound good. Well, you told me that part of your duties as the face of the organization 
was to be able to explain each part of the organization and the contest to people who are unfamiliar. Tell us a little more about that. So, you know, during a, during the course of a rodeo weekend, um, being that I wasn't competing, I was walking through the stands. I was introducing myself to people. I was meeting people um, and explaining any, you know, answering questions that they may have, whether it was, you know, does the, are the animals hurt? Do they get prodded by electric shocks to, to buck or, you know, um, do you, so I had to be able to explain our animal, our stance on animal welfare to people um, to let them know that no, our animals are not being hurt. Our animals are, are actually our number one priority. Um, They're better. They're taken care of better than we take care of ourselves in some cases. Um, I also had to, to know how to explain our gender diverse, our gender diversity, you know, people coming to a gay rodeo for the first time may not understand where it have, may never have encountered trans, uh, a person who's transsexual and who may be going through transition and may not understand why they have an Adam's apple, but they're competing in a male, ca- in a female category. So mm-hmm. I had to be very well versed in, in those topics to make sure that I explained every aspect of, of our organization and our event to somebody who just didn't understand. And my goal during that time was to make a um, turn a spectator into a fan by the time they left. And so if that meant sitting with somebody for two hours during a rodeo, then I would sit for two hours during a rodeo with them and explain every aspect of what they were seeing to them. If I had to. And I met some very interesting people uh, by doing that. How so? Uh, I got to meet people from all over, you know, at, in Texas, I got to meet uh, people from, there was people there that were visiting from Ireland and they happened to just, they went to a restaurant that was near the rodeo grounds and somebody told them that there was a rodeo going on. And so they went, they didn't even know it was a gay rodeo until they got there. Um, but they ended up staying the entire day. And I, I think I sat with them for a good hour, maybe, um, and explained the rodeo events. And I would come back and check on them throughout the day. And they ended up coming back both days. Uh-huh. In um, Denver, I met um, a group of people from Korea, South Korea. So there was a little bit of a language barrier, I should but um, but they had an interpreter with them, and so it was neat getting to talk to them and and get to you know they were excited to be there because it was something completely different for them. I was excited that they were there and they were having a great time. And so I got to answer their questions, you know, being able to uh, meet people like Lori Larkin from Dallas Housewives and being able to to speak about gay rodeo. That was a huge um, that was exciting for me. Um, Meeting people like uh, photographer Luke Guilford, who who published National Anthem, a coffee table book that was released last year, you know, being able to talk with him at all the rodeos that I met him at and sit for photographs for him and then being able to be in Vogue while being part of, mean? while being part of that, that release of, of that book was a huge, huge deal for me. Not because it, it exposed me and put me in Vogue. That was never my intention. My intention was to be able to speak about the International Gay Rodeo S- Association and the Western lifestyle within the gay community. Now, I can't help but ask, People from South Korea, for example, how did they react upon meeting you? Um, they, they were, you could see the shock in their face, um, you know, just because here you have this, this big burly body and then makeup and, and, you know, big hair, big jewelry. So it was, you know, they, they acted like typical tourists i guess the cameras came out and and you know thumbs started clicking and and flashes started going off and and they wanted to take pictures with me and and uh, asking me you know they were just asking me questions to their interpreter and the interpreter was like oh you know telling everybody okay y'all need to calm down <laughs> oh. um but then when we sat down and when they started watching the rodeo and i started explaining it to them you know then they 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 were engaged and they were excited and and so it was really it was really neat but yeah, it, to them, it was just a complete, you know, and I think South Korea and the Asian community, they're, they're, they're kind of used to, to drag queens. 
but I don't think they're used to it on a bigger level, you know. I don't think they're used to seeing somebody, you know, with with foot long earrings hanging from from their head or, you know, like hair that's four feet tall. <laughs> And 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 also, you know, as Miss IGRA, I, I I had the opportunity to wear this lovely thing, and uh, so when oh, you walk yeah. around with this on your head, you know, this usually attracts a lot of attention. Now, tell me, what were your feelings when you were crowned? I was, you know, I don't remember it. Um, I don't. Rem I had to watch the video uh, oh. that evening because it was just very, uh, very. Um, it was it was a blur uh to me i had never as a drag queen you know most drag queens are are pageant queens or you know they're they're performance queens and so if you're a pageant queen you're always after some kind of crown and uh i had never wanted to compete in pageants i had wanted ever only ever wanted two titles uh to ever hold and the first title i ever wanted was miss new mexico gay rodeo association and uh it was because of this crown. Uh, this is the original crown from Miss New Mexico Gay Rodeo Association. And I always thought it was the coolest crown um, that I'd ever seen. And and my thought behind this is, you know, you get to wear this and you get to represent the sport of rodeo. How awesome is that? You know, you yeah. get to sparkle and talk about rodeo at the same time. And then when I saw the International Gay Rodeo Association crown, I thought that's the other crown I want. And uh you know, it's unique to IGRA. Uh, IGRA is the only crown, only organization that uses this crown. Okay. That has this crown, and so we call it the satellite dish. <laughs> uh, and so I was fortunate enough to to get both crowns that I ever wanted, and and be able to wear them. And so it's it, it, to me, it's a huge honor to be able to to wear these either one of these crowns. Are there times when you do? Uh, not anymore. Uh, I'll wear them once a year, and that's for our annual pageant. Uh, we always give the honor of wearing the crown to the current title holder, okay. because it's it's their time, and it's their time to to be the main attraction. But when we get to crown a new Miss IGRA or a new uh, team, you know, we uh, make sure we're out there in force, and and we're all wearing our, our satellite dishes. <laughs> <laughs> but when we were preparing for this interview, you brought up a couple of things I found particularly entertaining. Okay. The concept of trailer hopping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. What are those? <sighs> Let me take a drink so I can... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there had there had the, the question that had been posed and and it's usually um, a question that comes up from the the community I guess at large is you know you always go to everybody's always looking for I guess the the inappropriate side to events um, you know people go to the gym to get ready for pride you know, so that they look good and they can attract somebody. And so I guess it, rodeo has its, its, uh, its naughty side, uh, I guess for lack of better words, but in straight rodeo, you know, you have what the, the girls that they, that follow the Cowboys and, and look to hook up with the Cowboy, they're called buckle bunnies. Okay. And uh, they're also called trailer hoppers. Okay. Um, which means they travel from trailer to trailer, depending on the night, um, hooking up with, with, with cowboys. And uh, their hopes, and the reason they call them a buckle bunny is in hopes that one of the cowboys will give them a buckle that they can wear. Oh. That's where the, the term buckle bunny comes from. So usually when, you know, you find somebody wearing somebody else's buckle, they're considered a buckle bunny because it's not their own. How does that work in the gay scene? Uh, same way, same concept. <laughs> you know, things happen at rodeo ground at the rodeo grounds or, or at the bar afterwards, and <laughs> and uh, either you go back to the rodeo grounds with somebody, or you know, uh, you meet somebody, or you know, now in the day and the day and age of apps of hookup apps, you know, 
you can have somebody come to the rodeo grounds, meet you at the trailer. And, and I think I told you, you know, one of the, the funnest parts, I think for me on, on Saturday mornings after a night at registration is watching everybody do the walk of shame as they come out of people's trailers. <laughs> but you also man, you also mentioned um, activity under the bleachers. Oh yeah. There's bleachers, you know, there's bleachers, bucking shoots, roping shoots, holding pens, you know, stalls, things, uh, things, naughty things can happen anywhere. I'm sure there's, I don't know what you mean. Oh no, I'm no, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> no. I don't either. I've never, I've never experienced it. I've just been told these stories. <laughs> now, I understand that the gay rodeo is uh, a derivative, or or it it germinated within the imperial court system. Yes, that is correct. So the first gay rodeo was held in 1976, and it was put on by Phil Ragsdale, who was imp- who was the current emperor of the Reno Court uh, out of Nevada, and that started as a fundraiser for muscular dystrophy, and so. Um, that's how gay rodeo started and it evolved from there. And then in 1993 and 1994 is when um, Wayne Giacchino, who was the founder of the International Gay Rodeo Association and a few other people sat down and actually developed the International Gay Rodeo Association. But yes, it was started by the Imperial Court System. (laughs) Now, what advice can you offer someone looking to not only get involved in the gay rodeo, but also somebody that may want to follow in your footsteps in the, uh, to become international Miss Gay Rodeo, Miss International Gay Rodeo, rather. I think one of the, the biggest, biggest lessons I've learned is to be open to suggestion, be open to uh, criticism, have tough skin you gotta have tough skin uh because you're not gonna please everybody Mm. and you can't please everybody and that's one thing that that i learned pretty quickly is that as long as you're doing what you want to do and the reasons you want to do it are good and they're focused on what your end goal is then you do it. You don't, you don't care what anybody else says. Um, you do you boo, <laughs> but you got to have tough skin and you have to be open to criticism because not everybody does everything the same way. And yeah. we have to move with the times. We have to change with, with technology. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest pieces of advice, of advice I can give is, is have tough skin and study. Study everything you can. What's the biggest misconception about you? Oh, the, one of the biggest misconceptions is that I am a huge and total bitch. Um, and, and I'm not. <laughs> Hi, okay. <laughs> um, I, have, I have what they call resting bitch face, or RBF. And I have had people tell me that I am so unapproachable uh, because I look so mean and I'm oh. really not. It's just the way my face rests. Um, it may look like I'm, you know, like I am angry, but I'm not, I'm really not. And I try to, to make sure that I'm, that I, I am not doing that. And I tend to sit with my arms crossed a lot, oh. um, which, you know, closes off somebody. And so it will make them unapproachable. So I try not to do that. And I try to always have a smile on my face so people know that I am approachable. But yeah, people think that I'm a huge bitch and I'm not, I'm really not. (laughs) Can you show us your full outfit a little bit there? I mean, can you get that on camera for us? Uh, I don't think I can, but I can show you that I do have one of my royalty team shirts on. Oh, okay. So this is the International Gay Rodeo Association logo. This is our okay. royalty logo. Um, and this is just one of our team shirts that we had in 2019. Um, one of the things that I did, I did have some stuff that I wanted to show you because I know we had talked about it. Um, nice. within, within rodeo, you know, people always ask, well, why do you do it? Why, why are you competing? Um, and I think some of the biggest reasons we compete is, you know, in every event, our 
top six places, you know, we place first through six, depending on highest score, fastest time wins. Mm -hmm. And um, each rodeo will give out ribbons. Oh. So first through sixth place, we'll get a ribbon. So this was one of our ribbons this year from New Mexico. Um, okay. And this was for steer riding. But this okay. was one of the first place. And of course, I just brought a second place just to, to show, you know, they're red. Oh, and red okay. and then they go through the other colors okay. and then those contestants that compete in multiple multiple events within one rodeo qualify for, for what is called the all around um the all around title and so um the person with the highest score in multiple events becomes the all around cowboy or cowgirl and they usually get um you know, it can range anywhere from a saddle to, you know, a buckle or, you know, some bigger prizes for, okay. for those events because they're putting a lot of effort yeah. into competing in five or six events in one day, you know, and yeah. it, it takes yeah. a lot of work. And so we usually give them bigger and prettier ribbons. Oh, wow. Look at that. Um, yeah. For them, this was a, a runner up cowgirl, all around cowgirl ribbon from New Mexico for this year. Okay. One of the ultimate prizes, though, is if you win overall for the weekend. Um, in any event, one of the big things, and this is always a cowboy, you know, all cowboys like to get these. And these, of course, are our buckles. Okay, yes. And so, you know, this was my buckle from when I was Miss International Gay Rodeo. Uh, okay. In 2019. okay. I don't know how well you can see it. Actually, yeah, we can see it relatively well. Yeah. Okay. So uh, all the events, all the winners in each event for within a rodeo will receive a buckle. Okay. At, at uh, you know, for, for, being the best in that event for the weekend. And so all the buckles are different. Each association comes up with their own design for their buckles. This, uh, this, this was made by buckle maker, Bob Berg. I believe he's out of Texas. And um, these were from 2019 and his buckles are really unique because they have a clip on the back. Oh, okay. That oh, okay. Yes. holds, holds onto your belt. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, I, I know I complained about these when I first got my buckle because trying to undo your buckle when you have to pee and drag with nails on, um, <laughs> kind of difficult to learn how to, to learn how to figure this out, but I did it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so, you know, these are, these are, these are just the prizes that we, and of course there's money, you know, we do get some money back, uh, prize money for those that place, I believe it's first through sixth place. Do get some money back based on the, the payout hire our payout rules for each rodeo fantastic so we're just not going out there to compete for you know for nothing we're actually out there to compete for prizes yeah yeah and uh you know um one thing i also wanted to to mention is that our rodeo officials so our our rodeos actually we have officials we have judges that judge these events we have uh arena directors that control the movement within the arena we have shoot coordinators which control the movement behind the the arena with the animals and getting the animals loaded and getting them in the shoots and in the right spot at the right time for the right contestant wow um, we have arena crews that are out there setting up the arena for each event whether it's placing barrels for barrel racing poles um laying down flower you know timing lines for for shoot dogging um we have these crews that do this. We have our timers and our scorekeepers that, you know, are capturing all the times and, and all the scores to make sure everything's documented properly. We have our wow. rodeo directors and assistant rodeo directors that work all year to put on these rodeos. And all our certified officials actually go through a certification process every year where they have to be recertified for these jobs. How They're just not, fascinating. Yeah, it's just not somebody who's just not out there yelling, you know, as an arena director. No, they've actually gone through the process to become an arena director and there's um there's a succession steps to it you know you have to have done this to gotten to this level to come to the next level to become an arena director so you know it's it's not just but it's we're all volunteers fascinating yeah <laughs> I, I never knew that yeah so all our rodeo officials are all certified rodeo officials they do know what they're talking about when they're out there judging a rodeo event they they know what they're what they're doing they're not just um, some person that likes the sport who says, well, I'm going to go out there and judge saddle bronc riding. No, they, they know what they're doing when they judge these events. Absolutely and of course amazing. it's, and it's, you know, like I said, it's all volunteers. We're all volunteers. When we put on a rodeo, none of us receive any kind of compensation for it. Uh, we do it out of the, the, the love for the sport and for the Western lifestyle and for the LGBTQI plus community. And, uh, you know, that's why we do it. 
but everything every rodeo is put on by by a group of volunteers priscilla bouvier you have taught me so much well i'm glad then my my day is done <laughs> i honestly have to sincerely thank you for teaching me personally so much about this i just didn't know <laughs> And I would like to thank you very much for being part of Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Well, thank you for asking, and I was honored to be here, and I had such a great time. I'm, the honor is mine, truly. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you.